Welcome, everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Kevin Modzelski from Anaconda, and he will be giving the talk on writing performant code for modern Python interpreters. And he'll take the questions at the end of the talk. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I, uh, I condensed the title of the talk a little bit. So it's now How to Write Fast Modern Python Code. And my name is Kevin Modulewski. I am an employee at Anaconda, where I work on the Piston Optimized Python Interpreter. And today, I want to focus on the word modern. There's a lot of Python tips out there. There's another talk right across the hall that's also about Python performance. And this talk, I wanted to, I wanted to do this talk because there's a lot of work that's currently going into optimizing Python that has downstream effects for what you as a Python programmer can think about to make your code even faster. So some of the tips that have been around for a while are not quite as useful anymore. And there are some new ones that if you get onto these new systems, you might want to start thinking about. So the, the structure of the talk is first I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes Python slow, what we're doing to speed it up, and then spend the rest of the talk going into specific examples of how those optimizations affect you as a programmer. Why Python is slow is a bit of a di divisive topic. Everyone seems to give different reasons. This is my personal take on it. Well, the most commonly given reason is that Python is interpreted, interpreted languages are slow, so Python is slow. But in my personal measurements on web servers, the interpretation overhead is about 10% of the time. So it's significant, people don't want it, but it doesn't explain why Python can be 10 to 100 times slower than C. For that, you need to go to a different set of things, which I'm generically calling dynamic behavior. Python is a very dynamic language, as we know. And I'm not going to list all the ways it could be dynamic, but I'm just going to call out a couple today. So the first is maybe the most obvious way it's dynamic, which is you don't write uh, types before variables. So the interpreter doesn't know what types any of the variables are. And yes, there are static annotations, but do you really want the interpreter to crash if your, if your annotation is wrong? It's not, those aren't used to optimize performance yet. So this is slow because it means that anytime you want to do anything in Python, you have to check, what is the type of this object? How do I do the operation I want on this object? The second thing that I called slow here is dynamic variable lookups. And this is something that we might not even think about because it, it doesn't seem like it should have to happen sometimes. But say you have a print statement. You print hello world or whatever. Print isn't a special word in Python. Print is just a function, and when the interpreter sees print, it says, okay, let's look up what this function is, and it does this whole lookup mechanism to see where that is. In particular, it asks, did anyone in this module override what the print function is? And it has to do that every single time you want to print something, every single time you want to take the length of something, cast something to an integer, any of these, all of these words require expensive lookups. And then the third thing I'm, I'm pointing out here are dynamic attributes that even within a single class, you in general don't know in advance what attributes exist on that class, which means that you need a dynamic representation of the attributes, which are pretty fast for what they are in Python, but they're still much slower than static languages. So with that little primer on where we, we started, there's three projects that are sort of coming out in various forms either last year or this year. Uh, the project I work on is Piston. It's a fork of CPython being run out of Anaconda. There's the faster CPython project, which is working directly inside CPython, and then all that work is going to start showing up in 3.11 in October, and that's being run out of Microsoft. And there's Cinder, which is out of Instagram and is also a fork of CPython. And these are all available right now in various forms. So this is going to be the controversial slide of my talk, which is why it's not filled in, because I'm going to go step by step with a lot of disclaimers. This is going to be the set of projects in this space and the benchmark, my benchmark numbers for them. So I think I'm going to get a lot of flack for this slide. So that's why I'm disclaiming it a lot. The first controversial thing is even choosing a set of benchmarks for analyzing performance. There is a very common semi-standard set of benchmarks called Pi performance. And it's nice in a lot of ways. It's like well-established. 
A lot of people present their numbers for it. I personally think that it tends to overstate performance benefits. And so I tend to like to look at more application code. So I wrote a Flask benchmark as well. Flask is a web server for Python and uh, maybe web application library. And it's one of the simpler ones, and I chose a simple one so that I could get more projects working with it. The next controversial thing is the selection of a baseline to measure everything against. I picked Python 3.8 because that's what Piston is based on. And specifically, I picked the Ubuntu build of Python 3.8. I didn't know this coming into this, but actually different builds of Python can be pretty different speeds. So like the, it, the same version of Python, but built in different ways will be different speeds. So the Ubuntu build is a pretty fast build. Uh, I believe the Mac and Windows builds are slow builds. So anyway, this is a Python 3.8 Ubuntu build. And we're measuring relative numbers here, so it's the same speed as itself. The next controversial thing is I get to list my project first. So Piston, um, we show improvements on both of these benchmarks. And you can see the relative improvement is quite different between these two benchmarks. So it is not getting into which is a more accurate, but it is important to choose which benchmarks you use that are actually representative of your programs because you'll get very different numbers either way. The next is uh, Python 3.11 Alpha 7, which includes most of the faster C Python work. This came out, I think, earlier in April, and they also show good improvements on both of these numbers. This is controversial because they, they say a different number for their Pi performance numbers. Um, I don't know exactly where the difference is, but they say 25%, but when I measured it, I got 15%. Then there's Cinder. They don't have releases, so I just grabbed their GitHub and built it. And very oddly, it was quite a bit slower than standard C Python. Um, so I put question marks here because I don't really believe these are real numbers. Like, they're using it internally, and I think they're smart enough to not use something that's slower. So I don't know what's going on here. I think they didn't like open source all of it. I'm not sure. Uh, now, this is going to be a little controversial. I put PyPy on here. This is a little bit more of an established player in the Python performance space. But they make a very different set of trade-offs, which I think show up in these numbers, which first, they can't run Py performance. So they don't support all of the dependencies of Py performance. And then they're slower on this web serving benchmark. And the controversial thing here is I did not put a question mark after their Flask number, because it is in line with other numbers I've seen of PyPy. And then I also took the time to benchmark Pigeon. Uh, I think it's a little bit less well known, but I've, I still want to know how it did. And uh, I don't know what happened here, but Pigeon was 1,000 times slower. <laughs> so that is like a double question mark. Um, I, I, mean, I assume that that's not the behavior that they get. Uh, but I didn't have time to, to sort all these things out before this talk, unfortunately. So this is sort of the state of like Python op uh, optimizers that aim to support all of Python. There's lots and lots of Python performance tools, but a lot of other ones fill more niche positions. So in terms of going back to what makes Python slow, we can start talking about what these projects do for those uh, things I mentioned are slow. The first is interpretation overhead, which is kind of just gone now, that a lot of these projects, such as Piston and Cinder, add JIT compilers, and JIT stands for just in time. So it means that instead of compiling your code during your development process, we will compile your code as it's running and convert your Python code into assembly instructions that is your Python code. And so this sort of definitionally gets rid of interpretation overhead. I'm not gonna really talk about this today because while it's really cool at a technical level and 10% uh, is really nice to get, it's not something that really you as a programmer can affect that much. You just kind of get it. You're not gonna really improve or uh, diminish it in any way. So I'm not gonna talk about it for this talk. What I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk talking about are the dynamic features. I listed a bunch of projects and all these projects do a bunch of things. But if, if I was gonna make a sweeping generalization, I would say the sort of bread and butter technique that all these projects are doing in many different areas is to use the combination of two theories. The first is that most code does not use the full dynamic power that it could at any point in time. And the second idea is that we can quickly check if code is using the dynamic power that it could. 
And so this lets us say that we can very quickly check to see that nothing strange is happening right here, and we can do something fast instead. And this is pretty much the source of most of the speed ups I showed you earlier. So this is quite effective. And this sounds great. You know, Python has dynamic features, but you're not paying for them if you're not using them anymore. But if we kind of reverse that statement, it kind of says that you are paying for dynamic features that you do use now. That before they were kind of free because you were paying for them whether or not you use them, so it didn't matter if you use them. But now, because you no longer pay for them when you're not using them, it is something that you as the programmer could think about and speed up your program even more. To be clear, you don't need to. Your stuff will be faster no matter what. But if you want to get the very best performance out of these new systems, thinking about these things will make your code even faster. All right, so the rest of my talk is going into examples. And the first one is that global variable and I suppose built-in variable case that I talked about. So say you have a print statement or you're printing out a bunch of things or uh, using when to get the links of things and you're looking up that name a whole bunch of times. In Python, there's a, in the implementation of Python, there's a very quick way to check were any global variables assigned since the last time I did this lookup. So you can very quickly check were any global variables assigned, and if not, then we know that the global lookup resolves to the same thing it did last time. And I should be clear here about what it means to assign to a global variable. I have two snippets of code here. The one on the left assigns to the global variable. It takes a new value and assigns it to the name of the global variable. And the one on the right I would call that mutating a global variable. And uh, the one on the right does not affect what I'm talking about. That's fine. But the one on the left, that assignment, uh, L equals new list, will slow down the following print statement. I put together a benchmark. And the numbers in this table are the time it takes to look up a global variable. And the two columns are, I did a first benchmark where we're sometimes also assigning to global variables and a second benchmark where we're never assigning to the global variables after initialization. And you can see what I mean by you're not paying for dynamic features in Python 3.8, because these are the same speed. It's doing the same amount of work. It's doing the full dynamic work each time, regardless of whether this optimization could be applied. The story is very different with these modern implementations. That with Piston especially, it's six times faster in the not updated case. I wouldn't take these numbers too literally. This, this table, I think, is going to evolve very rapidly. Um, I think I was surprised a little bit by this, these numbers. I think the faster C Python people like, have, might have some ideas from it. So the exact numbers are going to change. But I think the general conclusion that the no reassignments case is almost always going to be faster than the reassignments case is, will hold up over time. This leads to a pretty simple tip that I'm giving out, which is try not to reassign your global variables. You might have, performance might not be your primary concern, but if you're considering performance, assigning to global variables will slow things down. And if you still want global mutable state, then store it within an object as an attribute on an object or within a dictionary or something like that. The next set of dynamic behavior are attributes that I talked about before. As I said, you generally don't know what sets of attributes are gonna be on an object. And this means that we use dictionaries in general. There's, always, there's lots of special cases in Python, but in general, uh, Python objects are backed by dictionaries, otherwise known as hash tables. And Python dictionaries are very fast as dictionaries come, but they're still much slower than say in C, where it's just a direct pointer lookup in a single memory load. So even though each individual access is not that slow, because attribute access is such a common operation, a large part of the runtime does end up doing this. So we're going to apply the same optimization to this, which is we're going to assume that you're not using the full dynamic power, that you're not having your objects of different shapes and changing the shapes all the time. And we're going to say, I'm saying this a little vaguely because the exact technical restrictions are a little bit involved, but at a high level, we say that if a repeated lookup looks the same as it did the previous time, then we can execute it the same as we did the last time. 
And there's all these cases and all these special cases and different things that that can mean, and it's actually quite complicated. But the, at a high level, that's what we do. And as I said, there's a, a bunch of different things that lead to these technical restrictions, but I'm gonna call out two as things that you might run into that could affect this. The first is what I'm calling different shapes. It's the snippet on the left. We have two objects of this class, and they have different attributes on them. This forces a less efficient representation of the class's objects, because we can no longer say all the objects of this class have a single shape. So once you do this, this snippet on the left, at accessing attributes on those objects will be slow for the rest of your program. The other case that it hurts is what I'm calling type mutated, which is when you change attributes on the class of an object. So you can see here in the second case, we have an object, we set an attribute on it, and then we change an attribute on the class. And the reason this is really difficult for performance is the class has a lot of ways that it can intercept attribute lookups on its objects. And generally, they're not used. But so we have a very fast way of saying, did the class decide, sorry, we can say, we know in the past, the class did not intercept them, and nothing changed on the class. So now it's still not intercepting them. But if you change something on the class, we no longer know if you might have changed something that could now intercept attribute accesses. So we have to do the expensive check. I made a benchmark, and the third column is what I call the happy case, where all the technical restrictions are met and the fast path can be taken. And you can see from this example that, again, in Python 3.8, you're not really paying a cost for your, your objects being different shapes. It, you're doing a full hash table lookup no matter what, and it's the same cost. You already were in Python 3.8. I, I think it goes quite a bit back beyond that. You were paying a cost for updating your classes because that does invalidate a bunch of caching. And now in the optimized interpreters, the happy case gets way faster, but the other cases, not so much. And again, the exact squares that are good are gonna change over time, but the general idea here is that having your objects of different shapes or changing the types will generally tend to have the effect of slowing down your attribute lookups. So the tip here is basically just don't do either of those things if you can avoid it, especially the shape one. Uh, in looking at some code, I've seen code that doesn't, has objects of different shapes, and they were doing that, I think, to save memory by not assigning variables they didn't need. But that's also not a great tip anymore because by having different shapes, you're using this less efficient representation and using more memory in general. So in general, you want to set the same attributes in the same order. I'm not gonna get it into it in this talk, but if you know what slots are, those are now the fastest way to do attributes in Python. They don't guarantee good performance, but they give you the best chance. They resolve a bunch of the technical aspects that I didn't really go into in this example. There's a special case of attribute lookups, which is where you look up in an attribute and then you immediately call that attribute object. I'm calling this method calls. And so th that's sort of a two-step process. You look up the attribute, you take that object, and then you call that object. And there's this common piece of advice that if you're doing that a lot in a loop, you should try to do the attribute lookup only once outside the loop, and then call the object inside the loop. And that looks something like this, where you might say, um, say we want to append a bunch of things to a list, let's forget about list comprehensions and whatever else, and just say, we want to append a bunch of things. We're going to cache this list.append method and just call that attribute inside the, list, inside the for loop. And doing a benchmark, in Python 3.8, this is decent advice. If performance is what you're looking for, this does improve performance by about 66% in this case. The problem now in 2022 with these smart optimizers is the optimizers want to see more of your code at once to optimize more of it, in, especially in this particular case. The, this, this particular case is very special of fetching an attribute and calling it, and there are a lot of special optimizations just for that case. But by caching the method and separating them, 
those optimizations will no longer apply. And now with these modern Python implementations, caching this method actually slows down your code by a fair amount. So the situation is getting pretty complicated. So to be clear, this is just for functions on built-in types like list. If we look at Python types, the numbers are a little bit different. It was a little bit less of an improvement before versus the built-in type, but the improvement is even smaller now. As basically as attribute accesses get faster, the benefits of this approach get smaller. I looked at another case, which is not exactly the same, but looks very similar, which is where you're calling functions of modules. And I picked the function that I could find that does the least amount of work. I think math.square root, um, there's a square root instruction. So this is a single instruction. Everything else is overhead. So this is the, the maximum amount of improvement that you'll ever see from this case. In Python 3.8, it was pretty big. And in these new implementations, it is considerably smaller. Maybe you, you consider 15% to be enough, but it is quite a bit smaller than before. As I said, math.square root was picked because it is the fastest function I could find. If we look at a more typical function, say os.path.join, the improvement was much smaller before, and again, the improvement has decreased a lot. So now you're talking about a 0.4 to 2% improvement by doing this. Okay, so I've shown you four different cases. Uh, there's different numbers for them. Sometimes it helps a decent amount, sometimes it helps a tiny amount, sometimes it hurts. What, what is the takeaway? What should you do? My personal advice now is just don't, don't cache methods anymore. I, I think it's not worth the mental overhead. I don't think it's worth the readability hit. I think the, the improvement will get smaller and smaller as the implementations get smarter and smarter. I think you don't have to rewrite it if you already did it, but I think in general, this is something that we can leave behind as the implementations get smarter. In this slide, I'm calling out a couple of other dynamic features. I'm not gonna go into them a lot, but the point I wanna make here is these, unlike the ones I talked about before, these were already expensive before, but now these particular features are getting even more expensive because they inhibit other optimizations. So not just are they expensive when you use them, but they might affect other parts of your code that can no longer be optimized. And in particular, a problem that we need to solve as a community is attaching a profiler to this optimized code. Uh, at least in Piston, I don't know about faster C, Python, and Cinder, will tend to just disable almost all of the optimizations. So the code that you end up profiling might look very different than the code that you meant to profile with optimizations on. And this is in general a hard problem, and we might need a new profiling API. I don't know exactly what it will take, but this is un an unfortunate part of the situation. The last thing I wanted to talk about is the situation of C extensions versus pure Python. That generally, C extensions are thought of well, either as bindings to another language or as a way to speed up Python code. A common piece of advice is use Cython, convert it to a C extension, stuff like that. But this situation is getting pretty murky now because all of the optimizations that I've talked about today, they, only, they currently only apply to Python code. So this means that C extensions do a certain set of optimizations. The Python interpreter does a different set of optimizations and is very dependent on your code, which set of optimizations helps your code more. And unfortunately, it's very hard to give a good rubric for this case you definitely should put, do it in C, this case you should definitely do it in Python. But to illustrate this, I did, I took the, the benchmark from before, the attribute lookup benchmark. Uh, if you remember, this was, this 18.4 nanoseconds was the amount of time it took before. And I used Cython to convert this benchmark to a C extension. And then I ran it in Python 3.8. And indeed, it does make it a fair bit faster. And so that advice was good before that converting it to a C extension is good. But if you remember the slide of the other numbers, the other implementations sped up this benchmark much more than Cython did. And then also, the optimizations that these implementations do don't help Cython at all. So Cython could adopt all of these same optimizations. Uh, I don't think there's a technical reason that they couldn't. I think it's just, um, I think it will probably happen over time, but they currently don't. So 
This means that if you're particularly hitting the optimizations I've talked about today, you might actually be better in Python. As I said, there's not a really clear cut uh, rubric for when it's better one or the other. If I had to say, I would say that object-oriented code is gonna be helped a lot more by the new interpreters, and numeric code is gonna still stay best in C code. But this is something that you're gonna have to verify for yourself because, as I said, uh, it's fairly complicated at this point in time. Which brings me to my last point, which is that unfortunately, there's not a lot of help that you're gonna get with these kinds of issues. You know, I'm trying to give you the best tips I can now, but these things are changing rapidly, there's all these corner cases, and there aren't tools that will say, hey, this was slow because you did this over here, and so this optimization was turned off. That stuff doesn't exist yet. So your only method of telling how to optimize your code is you're gonna have to benchmark it and see what works and what doesn't. So to wrap up my talk, as I said in the beginning, the general idea is that we're, gonna, we're trying to make Python programmers not pay for dynamic features they're not using. And this is great, but, but it adds this new complexity that you get rewarded if you, are, if you do think about these dynamic features and trying to not use them. I put the GitHub links up on there. You can find all these projects. They're already available in different forms. And I believe that these are also the best ways to get in touch with the relevant teams. And so I, I work on Piston. If you want to reach out to me online, you can go to that, uh, the Piston GitHub page. And then I will also be hanging around here after this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I would now like to invite questions from the audience. Do you think the Rust extensions will be any different than the C extensions, given like cryptography starting to use uh, Rust libraries underneath? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think, well, I think the only thing might be, I think these optimizations are probably too much work for individual C extension writers or Rust extension writers to do. If I were to guess at how they would start appearing in C extensions, it would be that a intermediary tool like Cython would adopt them. So in that sense, unless Cython can generate Rust extensions, it might be a little bit slower getting to Rust, but at a technical sense, there, there wouldn't be any difference. Would it make sense to move your dy dynamic features in, like, in a different file on a different class and the, 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 the not so dynamic ones somewhere else can separate the concerns so give the, the optimizers more, more way, way to do? So just move your everything is dynamic to one place and not dynamic to the other place instead of mixing them? Would it help? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're proposing, but I think the general idea is very much happening. Uh, we're not doing it in Piston because we don't want people to change their code. But Cinder has this thing called static Python that might be similar to what you're talking about, where you sort of commit to not using certain dynamic features, and then the compiler is able to speed it up even more. Is that, is that what you're talking about? No, I mean, like, if, if, you, if you use one of the dynamic features, uh, that, that you kind of, like, instead of one class, you have two classes, one that use dynamic features, the other one not, that you can speed up the, the, the one that doesn't. Would it help? If you can do this oh. easily, if it just fits your, if you have a design decision to make and it wouldn't be any more work just to split in two classes, for instance. Yeah, I guess that could work. You know, if you have, if you have some type that you need to update a lot, then I guess you could have a different type with instances that you look up things a lot. I think you probably have some trade-off with readability and maintainability, but for performance, that, I think that could work for sure. What is your thoughts on uh, optimizations like using MyPy C and stuff like that? Like passing your programs into MyPy C? Yeah, I'm not super familiar with MyPy C in general, but as I kind of alluded to earlier in the talk, there are a lot of tools that, there's sort of a spectrum of how much Python versus how fast they are. And so the more Python you support, the less fast you can go 
And if you support less Python, you can go way faster. And so it's kind of nice that there are options all along that trade-off curve that you can use. I assume that MyPyC has some sort of issue with supporting everything, and that's why we don't just run everything through MyPyC all the time. But uh, that's a little bit of speculation on my part. Uh, so I was wondering, um, as far as uh, typing is concerned and as things get more static, I know in some languages, like in Scala, where types are sort of pseudo-dynamic, um, the type inference engine can get pretty slow when things are sort of missing. Um, I was wondering if that's something, you know, have y'all seen any sort of performance issues in terms of uh, the performance of, or, or, you know, uh, doing type inference on the fly? I would say that we do very, in Piston, talking just about Piston now, we do very lightweight profiling, which is basically for each bytecode, what did we see happen at that bytecode? And it is quite cheap to do that. There's no cross-function analyzing, whole program analysis, anything like that. Um, I don't know for the larger projects in terms of like actually the type inferencers or the static Python project that I mentioned, but for us it's not really an issue. Oh, anyone else? If you have any other questions, I would suggest talking to the speaker after, uh, either outside this space. Great, thanks. Thank you.